Before you watch this video, if you haven't already, check out the first part of this project, Air Lizards, by either going on my channel or clicking on the little white info card in the top right to watch that video. Or don't. Well, here they are, pterosaurs. As explained in the last video, they were the first of the vertebrates to truly fly. No more of that gliding junk for this video. We're looking at some real flyers today. Pterosaurs are also not merely the first, but probably the most outstanding group of flying animals. In their multi-million run, they became the biggest and weirdest creatures to ever take to the skies. Yet as usual, we have to start out with the small beginnings. So let's go to where we ended off with the little Preondactylus. The first pterosaurs like Preondactylus were able to fly with a simple but bizarre characteristic. Their fourth finger is shockingly elongated in order to provide a support for the patagium. Remember that fun vocab word? Their patagium is actually not just simple skin, but a complex interweaving of fibers. The wing is also supported by a special bone on their arm completely unique to pterosaurs, known as the pteroid bone. This membrane connects from the wingtips down to the ankles, we think, and even connects in between the legs, we think. As you might see by my hesitation, we don't know everything about the patagium of the creatures and exactly how their wings looked, but the current ideas are backed up by good evidence and hold merit. Anyways, with these finger wings, the earliest pterosaurs and all of their ancestors would take to the skies. These earliest pterosaurs, usually referred to as basal pterosaurs or informally as rampharynchoids, all had a similar body plan. They held a lizard-like quadrupedal stance with claws built for climbing. Their wings compared to later pterosaurs were small, and most had a long tail ending with a tail vein. Most notably, they were all rather small, feeding on insects, small vertebrates, and fish. These rampharynchoids were the ones who ruled the skies from the late Triassic period all the way to the end of the Jurassic period, and had many notable genera within their ranks. The rampharynchoids namesake, rampharynchus, lacked dental insurance, and therefore its skull was filled with many needle-like teeth angled forward. This, along with their geography and coprolite, shows these creatures were fish eaters, although how these tiny creatures caught fish has been speculated on. For a while, a theory stated that rampharynchus would skim their snouts against the water to catch fish near to the surface, similar to modern skimming birds, but they are merely not built for this. Instead, it is believed Rampharynchus would swim on top of the water and hunt fish, similar to modern seabirds. Another well-known Rampharynchoid was Dimorphodon. These dog-sized pterosaurs were actually rather poor flyers due to their short wings and robust skeleton. They would instead run across the forest floor to catch insects or lizards, and only clumsily fly when necessary, similar to quails. Some of the weirder pterosaurs during this time were the Ignorignathids. These differed from other basal pterosaurs by lacking a long tail and having a stubby skull, which makes them look more like Muppet than living animal. They are named after the Ignorignathus, which was possibly the smallest pterosaur ever, only growing a few inches in length. A Neurignathus and its relatives are believed to be insectivores, darting through the jungle catching insects not much smaller than themselves. There was also a second group of pterosaurs evolving in the mid-Jurassic, the pterodactyloids. These mainly differentiated themselves from the rampharynchoids by lacking tails and having longer hand bones, as well as longer, less toothy beaks. Pterodactyloids remained pretty outnumbered during the Jurassic, with only a few known Jurassic pterodactyloids compared to the numerous rampharynchoids. So besides those outliers, you might have noticed that the basal pterosaurs are not the most spectacular creatures. Sorry guys, but it's true. In the many millions of years they were around, most pterosaurs did not get much larger than a cat, and nearly all of them subsisted on the same diet of small animals and fish. The reason for this lack of diversity among basal pterosaurs is because after they got wings, the pterosaurs just became lazy. They had no incentive to evolve any further past little bug eaters so therefore stayed like that. The pterosaurs would need something to challenge them so they could be pushed to their extremes. 
and that something were birds. Birds began popping up in the early Cretaceous, and they too were small flying animals preying on insects. Finally, pterosaurs had some competition, and began evolving into different shapes. Gone were the long-tailed and toothy ramphoracoids, replaced by pterodactyloids. Why this replacement happened is because pterodactyloids, with their particular wing structure and complex air sacs, could soar over a vast distance, something both birds and basal pterosaurs could not do. So, as the dreams of ramphorinkoids were being crushed by the birds, pterodactyloids would find new niches and grow continually larger and more spectacular throughout the Cretaceous. But now, before we can go into the deep end of pterosaurs, we first must address why pterosaurs could get so big. Firstly, they were hollow, like the most hollow animals ever. Pterosaurs had very light and empty bones, which lowered their weight down tremendously. And as said before, pterosaurs had many air sacs around their bodies, with a very efficient respiratory system to decrease the amount of energy used while flying. But one of the most interesting traits that benefited their size was how they got themselves in the air via catapult. No, not like that exactly. Instead, the pterosaur's muscular forearms were probably strong enough to, along with the help of the back legs, sling the entire creature's body into the air, where it would then begin flight. This quadrupedal launch is much more efficient than a bird's, and goes to show the ingenuity of pterosaurs. So, with all of those advantages, pterosaurs could get bigger than any other flying animal. So let's finally see some of those giants that I've been alluding to. The first of the giant pterosaurs were members of the Ornithochiromorpha family, which appeared during the early Cretaceous. These pterosaurs did not grow too small, the tiniest still having a wingspan of 3 meters, with the largest genre, Tropiognathus, having a wingspan over 8 meters long. Their long snouts filled with numerous sharp teeth points to these creatures being piscivores, soaring over the oceans and dipping their snouts in the water to catch fish. One trait you may have noticed were these two crests that some ornithochiromorphs possessed on both their upper and lower jaws. These crests don't seem to have any practical purpose, but boy did pterosaurs love them. Another group, the Zungaripteridae, were some of the silliest looking of all the pterosaurs, with giant heads and a permanent smile. These creatures also had a crest located on the top of their head, as well as sets of crushing teeth at the back of their skull, which they used to crush shellfish and mollusks, their primary food source. The Tapajaridae family took crest to a whole new extreme, essentially carrying billboards on top of their heads. These pterosaurs also completely ditched the teeth thing in favor of a full-on beak, which they used to not hunt fish, but fruits and seeds. Already with these three early Cretaceous lineages, you can see a staggering amount of pterosaur diversity, both in terms of appearance and diet. More odd-faced pterosaurs with unique eating strategies popped up in the early Cretaceous. Little Leptostomia had a long and narrow beak, which it would have used to pick worms out of the ground, similar to modern kiwis. Among pterosaurs, this type of feeding is completely unique to Leptostomia. Another one-of-a-kind pterosaur was Pterodostro and its close relatives, which had multiple sets of long bristles in its bottom jaw. These could be used to filter feed, like a baleen whale, in order to eat small invertebrates in the water. As the Cretaceous period progressed, pterosaurs would continue to reach larger sizes, yet there is a common misconception that by the late Cretaceous, there were only big pterosaurs, which isn't true. New discoveries have proven that there were cat-sized pterosaurs even at the end of the Cretaceous. One pterosaur, named Nyctosaurus, was on the smaller end at a 2 meter wingspan, though it made up for this with a truly gigantic crest, which was three times the length of its skull. Another fantastically crested, but this time larger pterosaur, was Tupuhuara, which carried a massive elaborate skull on a 5 meter wingspan. Another pattern you might have noticed is all of these later pterosaurs completely lack teeth. This trend has continued further, the famous pteranodon, meaning toothless wing. Pteranodon was also very sexually dimorphic, with male and female once thought to be separate species. Female pteranodons have a small, lump-like crest on their head, and are dramatically smaller than the males. 
Meanwhile, the males have their iconic skull crest and possess a 6-meter wingspan. Pteranodon lived very similar to a massive albatross, spending most of its time soaring over the seas and subsisting on a diet of fish. But no pterosaur represented the potential of these creatures more than the giant Asdarkids. Asdarkids are most characterized for their weird anatomy. They are distinct for a gigantic stiff neck and head, which ends in an incredibly long and toothless beak. One part of their body plan you may have not noticed is their legs, which are comparatively long for most pterosaurs. Their long legs allow these creatures to actually be pretty comfortable moving on the ground, and they probably spent a good amount of time on land. Because of this terrestrial lifestyle, paleontologists now believe as darkids would stalk and catch small animals using their great size and reach, flying from one feeding area to another, just like the wading birds of today. This, in their appearance, has given them the perhaps overblown nickname of Death Storks, which sounds like a great metal band. As darkids were very successful creatures as well, soaring over all parts of the globe, including Antarctica. They also grew immense. The largest ones, like Quetzalcoatlus, could have a wingspan of 10 meters and could look a giraffe in the eye, making them the largest flying animals ever. Hatsigopteryx is not far behind in terms of size. However, it was much stockier and heavily built. This is because it was presumably the top predator of the small, now long gone, Hatteg Island, which lacked any other large predators and was filled with small dwarf dinosaurs, ripe for being preyed on by huge Asdarkids. Another contender for the largest was the more obscure Aramborgiania, who possibly had one of the longest necks of any terrestrial animal that wasn't a dinosaur. Aramborgiania also originally had the way cooler and pronounceable name of Titanopteryx, meaning Titan Wing. But this scientific name was already taken by what else but a fly. Thanks, science. Regardless of who was the largest, by the end of the Cretaceous, pterosaurs had become the masters of the skies. But all good things come to an end. With the extinction of the dinosaurs, also came the death of the pterosaurs along with it. It had long been hypothesized that these giant pterosaurs were the only ones left at the end of the Cretaceous and simply grew too big to possibly adapt to their extinction, unlike birds. A great ironic narrative that unfortunately is not true. As I explained earlier, small pterosaurs were still around by the end. But remember, even in the beginning, small pterosaurs were still many times larger than any backyard bird, meaning even the smallest pterosaurs could not have survived an actual apocalypse like the KT extinction. Some also theorize birds survived due to their diet of seeds and other food sources, which would have sustained an extinction event, which was not the case for pterosaurs. Nevertheless, pterosaurs, big or small, completely disappeared a good 66 million years ago. The age of the flying reptiles was over. Thanks for watching. As you could see, this is merely a brief overview of pterosaurs, since there is so much to them. If you are more interested in any of the animals, please check out the specific articles in the description. Thanks to the many images and videos I used to make this, especially to the artists who I will give a link to in the description. Of course, thank you for watching to the end, and see ya.